Art. Um, my name is Simon Moffat. I'm founder and analyst at the Cyber Hut. Um, and before we sort of dive in and, and do some introductions, I guess a quick um, couple of housekeeping things to mention. First of all, uh, clearly we are on Zoom today, so everybody is uh, centrally muted. Um, but of course, we do have the chat and the Q&A functionality available. So if you do have any comments or questions as we go through today's webinar, uh, please use uh, that functionality and we'll we'll try and answer the questions as we go along um, but we will be leaving sort of 10 15 minutes or so at the end to cover off anything that we miss um today's webinar is being recorded for posterity um so um uh, if you uh, if you want to uh, watch on demand at a later date you will receive an email after the event um it is great to be here today on yet another industry webinar. My name is Simon Moffat from the Cyber Hut. And today we've got a, a wonderful planned conversation, really looking into um, some of the key areas of, of uh, biometrics or the next generation of biometrics and looking at the, the, the some of the existing issues with things like one-time passwords uh, and the fraud and usability issues associated with them. Um, I guess, first of all, some introductions. Um, the Cyberhut is um, a boutique industry analyst firm focused on the emerging patterns in the global identity and access management space, tracking everything from authentication, authorization, threat detection and response, um, providing the market with a whole host of, of buy-side advisory and, and research services. And today, fabulous special guest, uh, the Fabian Abel from, from Keyless. Um, Fabian, hello, welcome. How are we doing? Good morning. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for having us, Simon. Oh, not at all, not at all. I'm really uh, looking forward to to uh, having a, a conversation with you about, about some of these topics. But I guess a, a good place to, to start is introduction to yourself and, and who are Keyless and, and the sort of backstory behind, behind uh, your journey. Yes, no, thank you very much. So I'm Fabian, one of the co-founders uh, of Keyless. Um, we are a passwordless authentication company uh, pioneering um, privacy preserving biometric authentication. So a phishing resistant multi-factor authentication capability that uh, is based on both device verification and um, yeah, true biometric um, or facial recognition um, in a device agnostic way that does not store biometric data anywhere. And yeah, we'll go into what, what biometric is, is all about. Um, not, not all biometric um, authentication methods are the same. Um, and yet we are providing that we believe optimal balance of user experience on the one side and, and strong security and account protection on the other. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating story. And I think in today's, I guess, highly digital world, you know, we, we're using, well, I guess, we're encountering authentication events continually, aren't we? Whether we are making purchases online, whether we're trying to buy a film or whether we're trying to log into our bank or trying to, do, do anything really in, in a digital setting we we're constantly having to to log in and authenticate i've done it several times this morning it's it's only mid-morning i guess and, and the dreaded usernames and passwords and occasionally getting the dreaded sms text message and by the time you receive it it's it's expired um or you make a typo and you have to get a new one and it's the, the it always frustrates me uh be being an identity for for such a while that we haven't fixed these problems but it seems like we have the technology, haven't we? And hopefully we'll, we'll unpick some of that in today's webinar and, and try and solve some of these issues around security and usability and, and allowing us to have a much more ubiquitous um, approach to authentication. So um, today's agenda, really, we're, we're going to go on a bit of a journey, um, a, a few different angles of um, conversation here, really looking at, at one-time password really has been around for quite a while in honesty a lot of um, organizations are using one-time passwords both in the employee space and in this sort of emergent customer consumer market as well as a is a means to i guess augment the password which you know we've been trying to kill the password for about 40 years i think um and it's unfortunately is still very much with us and the use of one-time passwords is an overlay to that has provided a bit of benefit clearly there's some um adversary inertia there it does it does prevent some 
very basic attacks on the password. But equally, there's a whole host now of quite sophisticated and popular attacks against OTPs. So we're going to discuss that a little bit and some of the challenges we face with the different one-time password types. And then biometrics really is is, is where we're, we're heading really as an industry, I think. And really to discuss some of the subtle differences between um, the biometrics, which you sort of get free, if you like, from your, from your mobile devices, but looking to, to the sort of next generation of biometric technology, which is more privacy preserving and, and uh, looking at how we can store and distribute the biometric information in the biometric templates. And again, maybe looking at some of the current and, and future uh, use cases and roadmap items on there as well. But I want to start off a little bit, just setting the scene of, of, of one-time passwords, OTPs, and there are very different types of OTPs, which we're all using uh, day in, day out. I've, I've used both sides this morning, actually, um, both the user-generated and um, server-generated. And I think one-time passwords, they're a good basic tool. There's no question of that. You know, they provide this dynamic way of authenticating, providing a, um, a credential, I guess, which is it's continually rotating, it's dynamic, it, it has an ability which it, it tries to reduce this man in the middle style angle. And I guess there are two main camps of one, these one time passwords, one that can be generated on the application side or the server side or you know, the, cl the cloud ecosystem, I guess, which is then distributed out to the end user via an email or via a text message. So it's, it's if you think about it already, there are, there are a lot of things that have to happen there. Code has to be generated. It has to be sent somewhere. I've then got to log in to either email or SMS to receive this. So there's a, there's a lot of moving parts there. I and mean, clearly, there are, there are a lot of failings and a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, anything in transit can be intercepted. Um, via the network layer, either at the, the uh, on the, the mobile side or within the sort of SMTP email world there as well. And even if it manages to get to the end destination, there's no guarantee that it's going to be Simon logging in to my text messages or logging in to my pre-registered email address to actually get that one time password. There's no binding there. There's no real linkage between uh, Simon and my email account. Um, clearly quite common to steal somebody's username and password for all the email or even pick up their mobile device and you know, uh, read the uh, one-time password that way. So there's, there's a lot of stuff happening in that in that whole journey. And I think it, there are lots of things can go wrong. And I think that is the, the more complexity you have in any of these journeys, the more things the adversary can attack, the attack service becomes bigger. I think this is where we're starting to see the, the breakdown of, of things like uh, delivered uh, components. The likes of NIST within their identity guidelines um, do not recommend the use of um, delivered one-time passwords to SMS or email. It's on their restricted list, actually, of MFA components. So they did a good thing, I guess, when they were introduced 10, 12, 15 years ago. Um, but I think as most things in the identity space, they have a finite lifespan. And their, their, their use, I guess, is, is starting to, to be exposed. So we then start talking about this user-generated one-time password. So this is where, again, you're using, leveraging your, your mobile app. Um, and within the mobile app, you have a, a generator, which is using a, a standards-based approach of generating a one-time password using a standardized algorithm. That's typically um, used in conjunction with a seed or, or a shared secret, something which is shared between the end user and the application that you are authenticating with. So even that has issues because you suddenly you, you have that um, an element of secrecy or a private element, which isn't always private. It's not stored necessarily um, in a, in a, in a tamper-proof or tamper-resistant manner on the mobile device. It has to be generated somewhere at some point and has to be communicated to the mobile device as well. It's often tied to a single device. You know, I've, I've got mobile one-time password apps. If I lose my mobile phone, I would typically have to re-enroll myself to all of the services where I've used OTPs in the past. So th these things are better than passwords, absolutely are, but equally they are not necessarily geared up for the, the mass volume and the, the usability requirements of things like digital projects online. Uh, in the consumer identity space. So absolutely 
a good starting point, but we're certainly starting to see now both the technical failings and some of the the, the um, some of the one-time fraud attacks. And I guess bringing you in here, Fabian, as well. I mean, I, I guess you, you've probably seen a lot of the, the, the a lot of your customers and clients experiencing, I guess, some of these fraudulent attacks. And the phishing as a service one scares me. That that, that, that to me, you, you don't need to be an expert anymore. I guess, do you? In some of these attacks, you can you can leverage other people to, to do the work on, on your behalf. Yes, no, yes, absolutely. And I think one, one thing you've mentioned, the, the one-time password itself, it's, it's typically used um, to augment the password as a knowledge factor. And the OTP, even though we, we call it password, it, is, it really is a possession factor. It's the device that receives the SMS or that generates the, the code in the Authenticator app. So it adds a real different authentication factor. Um, on top of the password, um, the, the the knowledge factor that you use. So you have a knowledge and a possession factor, certainly better than only one of those two. Uh, but yeah, you don't have that higher assurance of an inherence factor that a biometric would offer in really knowing it is that person who is authenticating and not just someone who is in possession of the device and has knowledge of a certain credential uh, as, as in a password or a pin code. Um, and then, yeah, there's there's threats uh, and we've and typically, we all, oh, I've used the SMS uh, OTP a few times uh, today. And you have yeah, SIM swap uh, attacks that we see here, which is basically yeah, an attack where the fraudster would harvest personal information from the victim through phishing, social engineering, and then uses those details to convince the phone operator to change the phone number to their device to then um, yeah, verify and complete the activity as in carry out the payment, log in to um, the account, et cetera. And the other element around, uh, around SMS OTPs is that as the seven signaling system number seven flaw, essentially a flaw in that um, overall phone protocol um, that allowed hackers um, to basically get access to SMS or, or calls, which is in unencrypted communication um, to then get access of these details. Uh, but yeah, that phishing as a service, uh, I think it just speaks to the point that it is a real industry. Uh, yeah. It's not just the doctor attacking someone, but you, you actually offer this as a service. And there was, <clears throat> I read a, a platform called Robin, uh, Robin Banks, uh, that offered a, a phishing kit called Evil Proxy, um, basically to spin up proxy sites to get hold of that information for uh, $1,500 uh, per month wow. subscription. So even if you're not uh, an experienced cyber criminal yourself, you can outsource outsource that for yeah not that much uh, of of a deal um, to basically provide uh, or carry out targeted attacks against uh, in this case enterprise um, or large organizations to get financial information login credentials of employees, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that is, it's quite scary. It is, it is scary. And it's, I think that there's some interesting, interesting uh, components to this. I think clearly anything as a service instantly in, in indicates there's a market for this stuff. So there's a market, there's a supply side, the, you know, the bad guys, if you like, who are, in honesty, you know, highly, highly, highly skilled. You know, they're developing platforms. They're building code. They're looking for for vulnerabilities. They are building out exploits against those vulnerabilities, and they're constantly iterating uh, the, the way they um, execute against these things. And I think as soon as you say there's a service there, equally the, the service providers are then competing with each other. So they are developing and building out better automated exploits. They are targeting. Um, services or certainly ways of accessing those services which, which generate cash for them in honesty um which, which is going to be targeting you know banking uh investment banking retail banking insurance um anything really where there's a, a financial transaction involved which you know clearly any, anything really in, in the sort of retail space in there is, is going to be targeted and it is lucrative isn't it i mean you wouldn't have these attacks if it wasn't lucrative and i think things like social engineering has been again has been around for a long time and you know the ability to to coerce individuals either physically or, or through things like phishing attacks and and all the sort of smishing and, and voice uh phishing and lots of other ways of coercing the end user into essentially giving away either you know, personal information or credentials or something about themselves to an adversary. And I think that angle is is becoming more and more complex and more difficult to identify. You know, most end users, you know, it, we find it very difficult to, to, to work out whether it's a legitimate, maybe call center ringing them up or perhaps an email or a, an SMS. I get 
two or three SMSs a week saying, you know, my Amazon delivery is late or whatever. Click on the link via your mobile. It's like, well, I haven't ordered anything actually, but um, you know, thank you anyway. So it's it, people are people are busy. They don't necessarily see the nuance of you know the domain is slightly different or the logo is different. So I think the the whole OTP fraud is it, it's becoming quite scary because there's a huge volume of end users using this stuff and they have the illusion of, of this is you know it's protecting them and to an extent it is but i think when you have automation when you have really highly efficient scalable platforms which are delivering you know threats and payloads which can exploit um, some of the vulnerabilities in these ecosystems i think it's it's quite a dangerous place to be i think sometimes and from, from the end user perspective you know, OTPs don't necessarily provide a great user experience. So suddenly if you have an average user experience and suddenly then a whole host of exploitable vulnerabilities, that that, that doesn't seem like a, a great a great place to be. And, you know, some of the costs associated with this, I, I found pretty staggering. I think the, the SIM thing, you know, four or five SIM swapping attempts are successful. That That, that is that's 80% really, isn't it? And again, I guess what your thoughts are here, Fabian, is that is that an issue with the the the, the mobile providers? Are they not doing checks on on that SIM you know, change or re reset process? I guess, or is it just simply a case of the adversaries are too good there? What, what, what's the sort of view there? Yeah, I think I think it is a combination of of both, and certainly phone operators are, are quite aware of of these yeah. um, phishing attacks or yeah, SIM swap attacks that that happen. Um, I think on the social engineering side, specifically in, in the context of stress uh, or crises, and we've seen that with the, um, the Silicon Valley Bank fallout, uh, where we basically read um, yeah, a, a quite a spike in, in phishing at, uh, attempts uh, against people uh, that, that are concerned or had bank accounts with the bank, uh, and quite uh, uh, yeah, an unexpectedly high volume of, um, of threats uh, in that context of stress. Um, in addition, I think what we what we didn't touch upon is uh, it's also quite interesting in the context of um, AI, chat GPT, et cetera, the whole automation at scale of these attacks. Uh, so it's not just a fraudster sitting at home doing it uh, herself or himself, uh, but it is actually code that can do that at scale. Um, and there, <clears throat> my my co-founders, Paolo Gasti and, and Giuseppe Fatini, has released a paper in 2017 called PassGAN, um, so a, a deep learning approach to password guessing, um, which compared back then state-of-the-art password guessing tools uh, like Hashcat or John the Ripper um, that basically use billions of passwords per second uh, and check that against or compare it with, with password hash hashes with an approach that uses, uh, again, a general generative adversarial network that autonomously learns the distribution uh, of real passwords from actual password leaks with a goal to generate um, higher quality password guesses. And the result back then was about a 50 to 70% higher success rate of guessing that password. Uh, now the AI evolution certainly accelerated quite a bit. You could overlay social media information that you find on the web, cultural backgrounds, educational backgrounds. Um, so it, it gets easier um, to, to guess that password um, with technology that, that is available today. So putting yeah, a phishing resistant multi-factor solution in place that eliminates that shared secret that can be guessed and now has a higher probability of being guessed um, is, is quite important. So it's yeah certainly the SIM swap is, is one element and we've seen that over the past, past years, uh, even though yeah pretty much multiple stakeholders are, are getting more aware or, and you know, more educated. Um, there's other threats around, around phishing and essentially that automating phishing at scale, um, which, which needs to be um, countered with a solution that, that builds in that, that security element. Um, and you basically cannot expect that from yeah, your, your mom or your grandma uh, in not answering to, to that phone call uh, or um, that, that email link. Yeah, yeah, and that, that, that's that's a really good point, isn't it? I think as soon as you, you bring automation into any of these attacks, the the adversary only needs to be successful a very very small percentage of the time for it to be profitable. And I think if you are in a position where you can, you know, automate and send out a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand emails, for example, or you know, attempt to 
T, T social engineer, you know, 5,000 mobile numbers to do a SIM swap, for example, you only need maybe 10 of those to be successful, 50, you know, the, the numbers are relatively small. And I think as soon as you're talking about consumer identity and customer identity and things online where you have a very large, broad user population who not everybody behaves the same. Not everybody has the same level of technical competence, uh, technical interest. We all use different mobiles. We all see things differently. As soon as you introduce automation there, but by design, you may well get 5, 10, 15% of that um, user population hooked, if you like, into that pipeline of, of um, you know, maybe exchanging information or perhaps giving something away which can help the adversary in their way. And I, I think, I think to me, I think as soon as you, you know, we start to see digital transformation, DX and, and, and transformation online, we're starting to see a vast, vast majority of, of end users who are not necessarily technical um, you know, technically savvy, and, and you know, honestly, they shouldn't need to be. You know, they shouldn't necessarily need to be an expert in in being able to, you know, handle and generate and reset OTPs on an app and scan QR codes and, and do this sort of stuff. They they want to be able to complete a transaction online. They want to be able to make a purchase, buy a book, watch a film, etc. And I think having quite inhibitive and and poorly designed login flows, which leverage. Um, uh, components and models which can be um, automated via attack is is not a great place to be at all. And I think it's we're definitely now in a position where we clearly have alternatives. Um, well, I guess it's it's probably time to to just to, to start discussing some of those alternatives and, and what we actually have. And I think the, the interesting thing for me is you know we've been on this a bit of a journey. I'll load this slide up here a little bit to to get to the top. And we've been on this journey as an industry, you know, looking at security and usability as, as most. Um, sort of authentication identity systems are trying to, to solve simultaneously. And I think the last sort of seven to eight years, we're doing more things online. We're, we're buying more services. We're making more purchases. We are enrolling and using uh, systems and services uh, in a digital landscape. And the acceleration really to having a usable, personalized experience has become huge. Um, I've I won't name the organization, but I have a, a gas boiler at my home and I need to get the boiler service. Great. I get the, the, the text message saying your boiler service is due and I, I attempt to um, interact via text. They you know, SMS me the, the appointment details and everything else. Couldn't get that to work. I go onto the mobile app to register and um, have my personalized boiler gas experience. Couldn't get that to work. The dates and the codes are all wrong. I need a usable experience. I, I I don't want to spend 15, 20 minutes of my day trying to get my boiler appointment service. It, it It's rubbish. So from a DX perspective, usability and personalization is huge. From a security angle, there's always been, you know, there's always been a conflict there. And I think we're now at last on this staggered journey um, to, to somewhere at the top right, hopefully where biometrics potentially the answer really to, to, to solving both security and usability concerns. And I think the other comment I'd make here is uh, we've done some research currently actually at the cyberhut looking at, you know, how many MFA components organizations have typically on the employee side here since we had, but you know, most organizations will probably have a combination or if not all of these individual components somewhere within their organization for employees and maybe for consumers too. And it, it can be quite difficult, I think, to, to stabilize on one of these factors. Um, and I, th I think biometrics ultimately is where we're all heading as, as an industry and as a consumer, I, I'd rather use biometrics than anything else. So we're definitely on this on this snake journey to, to get somewhere at the top, but not all biometrics are the same either, Fabian. I mean, we, we talk about, I guess there's two sort of types, which which I'll introduce here, but sort of feel free to, to, to expand this a bit further. But really I think there's, the, the, there's this sort of distributed local Biometric, which is the you know the thing, the data of my biometry stored in my local device, which it's okay in the sense of it's not leaving the device. But equally, if I lose my device, I have to go re-enroll, haven't I? I've got to go and you know re-register myself elsewhere. And I guess the opposite isn't great either, is it? Having a centralized uh, centralized store for all biometric information with with one service in one place that that, that doesn't seem great either. What, what, what's your take on on these two? Yes, um, no, fully agree with you. And if, if you were to ask the the general public from from a user experience research point of view, you think 
when someone is asked about biometric authentication, everyone thinks, yeah, it's, it's face ID uh, or the equivalent on the Android devices. Um, so it's it's quite ubiquitous. People are used to using it. Uh, it is, has become normal. It's not intrusive or people necessarily think uh, badly about it. But there's there's really a difference between that device native biometric that has the template in a quite secure area of the device, the secure enclave on an iPhone or the trusted execution environment uh, on the Android equivalent. So the, the data, the template itself is, is relatively secure on that device, but it binds the user to using that one device. And, and what, it, what it eventually does is it unlocks the phone as an element of possession yet again, rather than truly verifying the human behind the device, uh, because that matching, that comparison between the face that is put in front of that camera and the template that is stored on the device happens locally. Um, so you either know it is that part or you get the answer, it is the person, unlock the device, carry out an action, uh, or it doesn't match and the phone doesn't unlock. What's more, if I were to know your birth date, uh, I have a quite high probability on average to guess your four, six or eight digit pin code to unlock the device if uh, I just get hold of, of your device per se. So face ID doesn't protect from, from that attack. Uh, on the other side, um, when you truly wanted to verify that it is Simon in front of his device or whatever device you're using, you would need to perform that matching, that comparison between your face that you hold in front of your camera uh, and the template that you've enrolled and registered with uh, that is tied to your account, and not the device. Um, that happens away from the device, meaning you need a database where that information is stored. That introduces uh, a big risk from yeah, a, a compliance perspective of where the data is stored, a security perspective it happens with a data breach if someone gets hold and access to that information. User consent aspects, uh, ask, asking your users that can process that data and store that data for them. And it's quite yeah, sensitive personal information that you cannot change. Once once you have it, uh, the face doesn't change. The, the password you could, you could rotate, uh, the QR code you could rotate, but certainly biometric information is quite sensitive data. Uh, and yeah, that central or server side biometric offers that true inherence, the real identity assurance of knowing it is that person behind the device, which a device native biometric does not do. Uh, but it comes with um, yeah, their own limitations around the data protection, data sovereignty, and ultimately brand reputation that it is a stake if, if something happens to that information. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a really it's a really fascinating area, isn't it? I think the you know, ha having something central, there's that privacy angle, there's the, obviously that then becomes a central attack point, if you like, for, for adversarial behavior. And, you know, based on what we were just saying, so 10 minutes ago, you know, the, the adversary typically is lazy in the sense of they will follow where the, the biggest reward would be for, for the least effort. And I think having some sort of central storage, which, you know, many organizations and vendors you know, we'll say it, it's safe. We researched it. It's protected. It's got these, you know, approaches to to doing so. But everything is everything can be attacked in some way, shape, or form. And I think the adversary, instead of going for that distributed model, will simply go for those crown jewels, won't they? At some stage, and that privacy preservation angle there is is interesting as well. Around you know, does the service provider have full access to that material? Is it being shared? How is it being sort of stored and managed every day? Which I think is definitely a concern so i think it sounds like there are alternatives and i'd love to, to walk through these these four steps here where we're saying well actually getting it away from the devices is, is good but having it centrally stored is is not really the answer either but it sounds like a sort of combination of the two is is possible with with some very very cool uh, cool approaches here yeah yes so what um it is possible uh, and it it can guarantee a simple and slick user experience that the user is used to from that face ID experience of unlocking uh, an iPhone uh, and, and a strong um, security from both a data protection, data security point of view of where that data is stored, um, but then also from yeah that offering that higher assurance of really authenticating the person and not just the device that, that is being used. And the approach that we've taken with Keyless is a combination of uh, cryptography um, and, and biometric authentication, so proprietary facial recognition uh, and, and liveness detection that offers uh, multi-factor authentication with one look in the camera. Um, so it both, it combines possession, the device you're using and real inherence. Um, so the true facial recognition away from the device. 
without storing um, a biometric template anywhere, not on the device itself, uh, but more importantly, not in a database or on the server, on the server side. Um, so it offers two multi-factor uh, security, removing that knowledge factor that we do not want or that SMS OTP token that needs to be sent uh, or email um, with um, yeah, a strong, strong security element that essentially transforms that biometric information once the user looks into any of their devices um, and wants to perform an authentication, we transform that signal into irreversibly encrypted um, shards that we store on, on the server side, which in itself does not represent biometric data and it cannot be reconstructed. Um, and I think what, what every vendor would, would claim is certainly you do encrypt that information, but there is a difference between just encrypting the data, which is still biometric data under GDPR, and the approach of the cryptographic technique that, that truly transforms it and uses uh, yeah, the class of privacy enhancing technologies called multi-party computation, which essentially blinds or anonymizes that data um, in a way that you cannot decrypt or reverse it to generate or get a template, neither ourselves as the ones who would operate or a bank who would deploy this on premise um, or any organization for that matter. Would have would have the ability mathematically, um, logically, the ability to reconstruct a template. Uh, but every time the user authenticates, uh, we would verify that device as a possession element in the background and the user's face. Um, also ensuring it is a real human, not a video uh, selfie. I think that's another element in biometric authentication, which is quite important to avoid replay attacks. If I get a picture of yourself from the internet uh, or just uh, a video. Um, to yeah, prevent these spoofing attacks, um, whereby the result of this, so the user looks into the camera, we verify the device, the user's face, and we generate a unique uh, cryptographic key as a result of, of that authentication process that can then be used for a one-time activity, log in the user, sign a payment or a transaction, after which that secret disappears. Um, so we have no sensitive information that is stored persistently on the device itself, uh, nor on the server side, but we're getting the benefits of yeah, that server-side biometric matching that truly ensures that, that higher identity assurance of, um, of a non-device native, but a true server-side biometric match. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's, it's fascinating when you start talking about you know, some of the technology here, and it's, it's often a case of not trying to prevent the adversary from doing something. It's just like, actually, that, let's just remove that vulnerability entirely. You know, the, the inability to have um, that, that sort of central store or the ability to, you know, recombining to create sort of an ephemeral secret or something and it's essentially removing any of those inherent weaknesses that exist in in, in some of the other alternatives or biometric ways of processing which i think is is very smart and i think having the you know the, this the, the interesting angle there around you mentioned you know your, your sort of clients or yourselves don't have the ability to recreate this stuff either which i think is is fascinating isn't it it's you know if, if i leverage my, my banking app for example for authentication to to see my banking transactions the back of my mind i'm sort of thinking mm, is is my banking um uh you know service provider there are they competent really to, to deliver and provide some of this stuff and in honesty they probably aren't you know they, they're specialists in banking they're not necessarily specialists in security and authentication so it, it's it's actually quite reassuring isn't it to know that even the bank or the service provider even they don't have the ability to sort of recreate and and, and have that um, potential for malicious activity which i think is i think it's becoming more important isn't it as, as most end users are becoming more privacy aware and, and concerned about you know where their biometric data is going um the, the, the privacy angle i think we've covered a couple of these questions here actually but i think when we talk about biometrics and we sort of see the, the sky fi films and we, we talk about you know when the guy gets his you know finger taken off and the, the thumb is just a thumb and they can use the thumb to open up the, the space ship door and, and things like this i, I, I think it, most end users are concerned about biometric information whether it's the face on facial recognition or the replay attack or using a photograph of your face etc or, or or whatever it sounds like to me we're getting very close to this this position where I mean, biometric material it can't really be stolen because it sounds like it's in different locations number one so it, it, is that is that first question have, have we ticked that one off can, can this stuff be stolen and, and recreated it, it doesn't sound like that that's a potential there 
Yes. Now with, with keyless, that biometric data cannot be sold cannot be stolen because it, it doesn't exist in the first place. It, it is captured on the device, but then transformed immediately. So what leaves the device is not biometric data. And it isn't stored anywhere persistently, not on the device itself. Uh, but from, from a biometric authentication perspective, so not the, the, the data storage element of the biometric uh, information, but then the that authentication itself, um, any biometric authentication system generally includes some form of anti-spoofing or liveness detection um, elements to prevent from replay attacks. Uh, and here the, the difficulty or the, the issue is either if you were to get hold of that information because it can be stolen technically because it sits on a central server or you get hold of that user's face from the internet, your personal photographs, what, what have you, to, to basically create artifacts that you can then pre present to that biometric system, basically hold in front of that camera. Um, and there, yeah, we're using um, uh, our proprietary anti-spoofing elements as well to prevent from, from these attacks, which could involve pictures, videos, 3D printed masks, and, and those types of artifacts. Um, but yeah, more importantly there, in addition to preventing those replay attacks or spoofing um, attempts, uh, there's also no issue around the data storage um, of, of the biometric data with keywords. Yeah. Yeah, oh, fantastic, fantastic. And the other, the other one, which which always concerns me, I guess, sort of taking my tactical hat off for a second, is the is the the recreation angle. Um, and, and again, things like one time passwords with with you know, shared secrets, things like local biometry to access my Android device. If I lose my device, I'm back to square one again. So I've got to go and do an enrollment process, which. You know, if I'm honest, if this is for something like um, online banking, enrollment is a bit of a pain. You know, there's going to be lots of steps involved there, probably having to ring help desk. You know, nobody wants to do that ever. Um, having to ring and maybe you know, present my card details or something, which is going to take me at least 20, 30 minutes or whatever. So can, you know, can this be recreated or rehydrated if I lose device and maybe if I migrate to a new mobile phone, if I decide to upgrade? Is that easier now then if, if things are sort of distributed and can be rehydrated? Yeah, that is conceptually, that is the beauty of uh, a server side biometric system that you're not bound to a particular device where you have your template, your face stored that you're matching against, but it sits on the server side. So you're independent to the device that you're using. Um, and that is the, the same with Keyless. So there's either um, the the, the option for users to use multiple devices. So you don't have to use the only the, the iPhone that you have. You can use your second Android device, your tablet, uh, and link that device to a specific account without having to re-enroll your biometric template. So your face again on a device. You need to authorize it and make sure it is you linking a new device to your account uh, and linking that device or binding that device to the account for an authentication to, to work in the first place but you don't need to re-enroll your, your face again. So if you were to lose a device, you could simply revoke that particular device if you have another device that is linked to the account yourself. In, in the instance of basically losing um, or having uh, your device, all your devices stolen, and there's no, no single device that you still have associated with your account, uh, what we're able to do is um, recover access or uh, yeah, reset account access from a wholly new device um, with an application uh, that is able to link your unique identifier, your username, as in your email address or your bank account number, uh, and your face uh, to your account without the need to call a support center or walk into a branch uh, or a physical location to identify yourself, um, but to do that fully self-service without the need uh, for third-party support. Yeah, I think that's, that's such a a next generation thing isn't it i think that that really is is, is going to really help hugely with adoption of, of any biometric technologies that ability to give the end user more like that self-service capability they can do things autonomously they can do things away from from having to, to contact somebody or go through this re-enrollment aspect and i think that is that is a really uh, a huge feature which really will, will accelerate adoption of, of, of technologies in this area i think and that is not um, really a, uh, if, if I may, a user experience point of view or uh, a cost reduction point of view, certainly from, from a support angle there. It's also when we started the conversation around SIM swapping uh, and those social engineering attacks, which typically comes from that reset process. And 
I know where you live. I know when you're born. Uh, I call the support center and try to impersonate yourself and get that information, that pin code, that password, um, in order to log in and, and recreate um, that account access. Uh, so a lot of the account takeover uh, fraud issues or challenges that we're seeing uh, are, are tied to that account recovery process, uh, which is a big element um, in, in that journey as well. It's not only certainly the user experience point of view or the data protection point of view of the biometric element, but then also the, the threats from that user journey itself uh, that, yeah, account oh, fraudsters um, typically try try to leverage. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. I think you mentioned sort of the reset process there, the revocation reset process. I think what we're starting to see clearly is, you know, the, the use of biometry isn't just logging in once to services. It, it's being applied to a whole host of different use journeys within that ecosystem, the digital ecosystem, right the way from onboarding. And I think this has um, become a real um, real tipping point in how we use things like mobile devices over the last two to three years when we've we've all, we've all been at home because of the pandemic or all using digital services. You know, people are joining and starting jobs and they never go into the office, but they have to enroll and onboard themselves either to their um, organization or to a new service online. You want to do that remotely. You want to do it via mobile um clearly if we're doing things like payments transactions high risk events um and, and you know the whole self-service aspect as well so it, it's interesting really that we're seeing biometry across a whole host of of different use cases and the flows have to be the same that you, if, if you have self-service for one you really should try and achieve self-service for the others and i think I guess I'd love to hear your sort of take here, really, on what, maybe any sort of additional future use cases that, that you may have sort of seen or heard. Yes. Uh, no, I think it's the, the important aspect there is is being able to add a, a biometric element into the mix um, yeah. that requires a, a one-time enrollment and can be triggered for, for any user journey uh, that is applicable, be it the login event, be it only for high-risk transactions where you step up with a biometric to really ensure it is that user for that particular higher risk transaction um, that is different for, for every organization. It might be, I have a high value withdrawal, high value payment, uh, changing your personal information, uh, things like that. Uh, and then certainly for the for the recovery process, um, where you can enable uh, yeah, uh, a more user-friendly uh, and, and cost-effective way of, of recovering uh, user accounts. Um, and, and I think there the, the most important aspect for any organization that is adopting a biometric is, or yeah, a multi-factor um, biometric in, in that sense is the, the ability to do that in, in a frictionless way from an implementation point of view, that there's no rip and replace, but you have your orchestration capabilities, your risk engine that is in place that basically just ties in an API to call that biometric for whenever you choose to, um, and, and you're in control rather than having to undergo a, a whole new digital transformation just to add an additional yeah, authentication element to that mix. Um, but then once it is but it, once it is in place and you can sort of use it as a module, uh, you're relatively free um, to choose the use cases that, that you'd like a biometric to be inserted um, if it is a, a flexible um, um, yeah, capability from, from an integration and adoption point of view. Yeah, and that's the that's the key thing, isn't it? It's it's making it a, a sort of business as usual operation, so it can just be deployed in an agile fashion as sort of new emerging use cases um, arise. Maybe new systems, new ways of um, communicating with with different backend services. Um, I think having it is that agile component, and as you say, not having to re-engineer all of these user flows. I think is a huge, uh, a huge, um, hugely important way of improving adoption and you know i think we've, we've seen over the last sort of half an hour or so you know the, the technology is is available and it's it's delivering you know some of the key um, solutions to the problems that we've had for 10 or 15 years around security around usability around fragmented journeys and and having uh, i mean different different ways of onboarding and, and different ways of doing a transaction a different way of then resetting things which any um, changes to those is, is beneficial if it can result in consistency and the same experience and you know empowering the end user to be able to essentially get on with what they were trying to do, which is make a payment, payment or, or do something 
online, which I think is really what, what we're all trying to do in a digital landscape. And um, we're sort of wrapping up, coming towards the end of, 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 of the, the journey we've, we've been talking about. It's been a fascinating conversation looking at clearly some of the issues that we all know about really from, from a one-time password perspective. But I think it's been really fascinating to, to understand some of the real nuances and differences around biometry and how we can improve the adoption of biometric technology. I think it's it's great to uh, great to hear that we have some some solutions which are there today. It's not it's not the future, is it? It's it's right now. And you guys have got some some fabulous case studies and, and references on on some of these deployments. So uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. One or two questions appeared to come through. Um, it's quite interesting one actually. I suppose it continues a little bit with what we've been talking about. But how does Keyless integrate with existing onboarding flows so again i guess back to that integration angle and, and how people can get started i guess yeah oh that's an, an important element especially for new account creations uh, where i think the the important aspect you want to ensure is that it, it is a frictionless process from the user's perspective and there's only one selfie that is required to carry out the uh, identity proofing uh, document verification process and the enrollment uh, into keyless for subsequent authentication uh, and the device binding element. Uh, and yeah, we have we have flexible integrations to um, a range of uh, close partners, uh, but also an agnostic way of integrating with um, onboarding providers or KYC providers for, for that matter. And we've also found there are certainly global players, uh, but in the end, it's also a very regional requirement, um, depending on the ge geography or the local um, data sovereignty type requirements uh, for onboarding. Um, we've, we've built out um, several tighter integrations from a product perspective or an agnostic way where we either take the selfie from the onboarding provider or pass that on, uh, and we can assure that it is a seamless flow for, for the end user uh, when they're enrolling and creating the account for the first time. Super, super. Um, I get another request. So I'll call this a little bit earlier, actually, but do, does Keyless protect the data at rest? Yes. So we protect the data at rest, meaning uh, we go beyond that as in there is no sensitive data that we store in the first place. There is no biometric data that needs to be protected at rest. In addition to that, uh, we protect that data at use as well. So when we're performing that biometric matching, um, there is no sensitive data that leaves the device um, that is then matched in that binary yes or no, or that cryptographic key essentially that is generated as a, as, as a result is um, is in the clear at any given point in time. So everything happens uh, on encrypted information. Uh, no data is ever decrypted. Um, but yeah, at, at rest and at use, um, the data is secure with keywords. Super, super. So I think it's uh, it's, it's certainly uh, it's fascinating technology. I think it's really going to open the door to, to many organizations adopting a a biometric approach where you know you, you can augment those existing journeys and flows and applications which are using you know legacy approaches but equally there's the there's the confidence that you, know, you really are removing some of those key vulnerabilities and and how the information is stored and, and rehydrated i think is a, it's a fantastic opportunity for many um we're going to head, head towards the end of this conversation Fabian. it's been absolutely fabulous um chatting with you today i guess a couple of calls of action from, from your side there's um demos and case studies on the on the keyless website um which I encourage everybody to to take a look at and um, we will um follow up and share the uh this, this deck with you to get the links and things afterwards um but fabian it's been a fabulous conversation um any any sort of last minute comments and thoughts from yourself be, before we close off likewise no thank you very much very much enjoyed uh, that session and yeah please if uh, any of the participant has has any questions don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me or any one of of the team i uh, would be delighted to take that conversation forward no, thanks thanks so thanks thanks everybody for for joining um as i said this has been recorded and uh, you will receive an email afterwards to watch on demand as you see fit but this has been a fabulous conversation uh, with fabian from keyless and myself simon moffat from the cyber hut uh, until next time uh, thank you for joining and uh, stay safe everybody thank you thank you very much